Uh, I'd like to uh, start out by uh, acknowledging the land that we're all on, uh, the, uh, the, the Indigenous land that's most recently taken care of by the Haudenosaunee people. That's the Mississauga, or that's the uh, Six Nations of the Grand River and the Ojibwe's, uh, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, uh, Chimigwich. Uh, thank you to them for allowing myself and those of us who are um, who are visitors to uh, to this Indigenous land. Um, I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit about myself. I'm from the Yellowknife Dene First Nation in the Northwest Territories. I'm a clinical psychologist and a health researcher. I've been engaging in academic Indigenous health research for about 18 years. Uh, the last 11 years here at the University of Toronto in the Department of Applied Psychology and Human Development at OISE. And prior to that at the University of Victoria where I completed my graduate training uh, in psychology. And for the last year and a half, I've been the director of the Wakaban S. Bryce Institute for Indigenous Health at the School of Public Health here at the University of Toronto. Um, so I've been asked to come here and talk about the impact of inequalities on the mental health of Indigenous people in 30 minutes or less. So I'm going to try to condense a large amount of information uh, into, uh, into our presentation. Uh, before I start though, I'd like to get a little interactive so we can start to have some fun today because we're all here to enjoy ourselves and, uh, and, and promote uh, the relationship between all of us. I'm wondering if uh, anyone here knows how many Indigenous people are in Canada. Just shout it out if you, if you have any ideas. Sorry. Five million? Okay, who else has a guess or no or knows? 600,000. 600,000? Someone's shaking his head back there. What do you think, sir? 600,000? Who else has an idea of how many Indigenous people? 3.5%. So what would the number be? How many Natives live in Canada today? Pardon? So I can't hear you. One and a half million. One last, one last go at it from anyone? Three quarters of a million? No, three, three, three and three quarters. Three and three quarters. That's very specific. <laughs> okay, those are, those are all good guesses. But I heard someone ask me a question, how do you define Indigenous people? So that would be my other question, who are Indigenous people? Who knows who Indigenous people are? If someone were to come up to you and say, you know, what are Indigenous people? Who are they? What would you say? Okay, how about one person at a time? Who, sir? A population who owned the country before we got here. Okay. Who are Indigenous people? Ma'am? First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Well, I think we can just stop there because 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 uh, we had a couple different definitions, which are which are all correct. It's all correct. The indigenous people comprise three distinct cultural identities. That's the uh, First Nations, who are status and non-status Indians. The Métis, who are a distinct cultural identity that was created through the intermarriage of the James Bay Cree and the French fur trappers and they have their land base in the Red River region of Manitoba. And then the third identity of Indigenous people in Canada is the Inuit, who are the Indigenous people of the far north. And how many Native people live in Canada? Well, according to the 2015 census, around 2 million Indigenous people live in Canada. Uh, however, that's thought to be an underestimation uh, by Indigenous communities and the number is probably realistically around double that. Uh, 
And there's a lot of issues related to colonialism and oppression as to why Indigenous people do not come forward to be counted in the census, which we'll unpack as we go along. One more question to keep the fun going. Um, where would you find Indigenous people? Where do they live? Those are, good, those are all good answers, and, and Toronto is actually a good answer because Toronto has the highest number of Indigenous people of any place in Canada because around 70, 70 to 80 percent, depending on whose data you're looking at, 70 to 80 percent of Indigenous people live in cities and towns. That is, they live off Indian reserves. So we have the majority of the population living in cities and towns with the highest number of Indigenous people in the city of Toronto, in the GTA, with the highest rate of Indigenous people in the city of Winnipeg. Um, the Indigenous population is remarkable in that it's very young and it's growing very fast, with most of our population under the age of 24, and of those under the age of 24, uh, over half are under 16. So Indigenous people represent the largest and fastest youth demographic of any population in Canada today. And that's for a number of different reasons, which, which we'll sort of talk about. So in order to have a fulsome discussion and understanding of Indigenous health and mental health issues today, we have to talk a little bit about the past, because the past sort of explains where we are today. And it's been substantiated in the literature that Indigenous people in Canada have experienced what we call uh, multiple historical colonial aggressions and assaults. And these are mainly through systems of health and education, as well as, well as child welfare and the justice system. Education was, main, was used as a large tool of oppression for Indigenous people through the creation of the residential school system. Child welfare, uh, health care, uh, and segregation are also other sites of intensive and invasive harms that Indigenous people have experienced and continue to experience today on a very personal level. Education uh, is one of the areas that we're going to talk about in depth because that's something that has had a huge impact on the mental health and well-being of Native people. I'm going to explain a little bit what that's about. A lot of people ask, what is residential school? And it's an extensive school system that was set up by the Canadian government and administered by churches at the national level in Canada. Residential school uh, was a policy that was enacted as part of a larger law that created Canada, and that was called the Indian Act. And that began in 1876 and still stands today with all of its policies and regulations that uh, control the lives of Indigenous people in Canada. The Indian Act uh, was created to enact federal policies that if they weren't followed were punishable by the justice system. Uh, many of these policies have been removed or revised. Many of these policies still stand. Uh, the Indian Act was created in order to legislate unfettered access to the lands and the natural resources uh, of Canada in order to make way for European settlement. Uh, federalists uh, in our country saw Indigenous people as a barrier or problem to uh, settling and creating their new country, so they knew that they needed to make laws to deal with the Indian problem, and the Indian Act was their solution to that. The goal of the Indian Act, uh, as, it, as it was enacted in 1876 and as it stands today, was to eradicate the indigenous population through cultural genocide and assimilation. So we can see the many policies of the Indian Act were to that objective of uh, eradication and assimilation. And I'm sure you, you know about these because you're, you're Canadian and, and you're all educated. And, and these, are the law, these are the policies and laws that, that built your country. So I'm not going to read them. They're all there if you ever want to look them up. Um, the primary objective of residential school as part of the Indian Act uh, was to forcibly remove and isolate children from the influence of their homes, families, and cultures 
and to, and to assimilate them into dominant culture. The federal government, in its attempt to uh, eliminate this population based on race, believed that the best way to destroy the family was to take away the children. So they created this policy and this system in order to do that. And it was deemed as very successful at the time because the goal of the Indian Act was to ensure that there were no Indians left in Canada. Now we know that that has failed because we have at least two million counted here today. So here are some pictures that show the success of the Indian residential schools. And in the Indian Act, it was written that the goal of residential schools was to kill the Indian and the child. And this was based on assumptions that indigenous cultural beliefs and spirituality were inferior and unequal to Euro-Canadian Christian ones. And that's a picture of my mother who went to residential school for 13 years. Uh, my father went as well. That's where they met. If they hadn't gone to residential school, I wouldn't be here because they came from two separate nations across the country. Here's another picture from the Archives of Canada that shows the success of residential school. And here's another picture that shows the success of assimilation and cultural genocide. In 2008, our then Prime Minister uh, made an official apology to uh, Indigenous people. And uh, this was really under um, charges and pressure from the United Nations and uh, a lot of human rights charges that had been brought against Canada for uh, different policies of the Indian Act. And in fact, the Indian Act and residential schools were seen to be so successful that the Dutch came to the federal government of Canada and asked their help in creating the apartheid system, which was modeled after the Indian Act. Uh, in the early 2000s, under charges of human rights violations, uh, against Indigenous people because of residential school. The federal government created, I mean, there was a lot more to why they created this, but this was part of, part of the reason, created the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, whose goal was to investigate how residential school had harmed Indigenous people who had attended and their families. Part of, and, and up until around 2006, the idea of residential school and the topic of residential school really didn't come up in Indigenous communities because people who attended residential school and their families were told never to talk about it. And this was something we were never allowed to talk about. Even though everyone in my family, including my five younger brothers and sisters, all went to residential school and my parents and two of my grandparents, the word had never been mentioned until 2007 to me when the TRC was struck and started putting out these public announcements to invite survivors of residential school to go and register with the TRC in order to begin to uh, get some redressment for the harms that they had experienced. So that was the time when research started being done. And the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, which itself was a branch of the federal government, um, began to start to investigate uh, and research who went there, how many people went, what happened. In order to get those records, they needed to come from Indian and the branch of Indian and Northern Affairs, which is the branch of the federal government which administers uh, uh, the Indian Act. Well, Indian Affairs refused to give over any of the records of residential school, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission had to sue the Federal Bureau of Indian Affairs in order to get those records in federal court. That's how much of a difficult issue this is for Canada to deal with. So when they started to get some of this research and some of these facts, it was found that they had records that showed that 150,000 Indigenous children attended these schools from the 1870s to the 1990s. The last school closed in 1996. A minimum of 3,000 children are known to have died, and 500 of those who are known to have died have unknown identities. Disease was the major killer, and that was second to malnutrition, drowning, exposure, things related to neglect. Because these residential schools weren't like boarding schools where we sent children who had affluence and who wanted a better education. These were places where children were kept in inhumane conditions without sufficient food, water, warmth, cool, 
uh, education. Uh, most children couldn't read or write by the time they left residential school, whatever time that they had left. The, f the focus wasn't on academics, it was on a sim cultural assimilation. Uh, many children were victims of physical and sexual abuse and assault, and many children died trying to run away or by suicide. In the fields of mental health, we talk about intergenerational trauma as one of the legacies of residential school. So what this means is that when a person experiences trauma, it gets passed on through generations, through relationships, through social mechanisms, through the environment, uh, and through other systems. Uh, collective trauma is also something that needs to be considered in the context of a group or community's shared stressors and experiences. And Indigenous people who have been through the residential school system, who is every Indigenous person that you will see alive today, has either been directly or indirectly impacted. So to make this a little bit more real for you, so I'm 45 years old, I have six younger brothers and sisters, Four of them went to residential school. The other two were taken in the 60s scoop, and then another one died. I was also part of the child welfare system as a child. That's why I didn't go to residential school. And so we all either went to residential school or were put into foster care as young children. That means that our children, who are ranging, my brothers and sisters, we all have a lot of kids, um, our children in the next generation range from age two to 20. That means that that two-year-old, my sister's two-year-old, represents the first generation of children not to be directly impacted by residential school or the 60 scoop. So in other words, this isn't something that happened a long time ago or hundreds of years ago or generations ago. This is something that our communities are dealing with right now as a health and mental health issue. When we look at intergenerational trauma and we look at how it is mediated and what happens when people experience a severe trauma in their life, especially early in their life, what happens is if they aren't living in a safe and secure environment where more traumas and more bad things happen to them, that trauma and risk for trauma accumulates over that person's lifetime and over generations. So let's say I had a car accident now uh, and, um, and I got really hurt. How I healed from the trauma of that car accident would be mediated by my own history of trauma that was either resolved or unresolved and what kind of other traumatic things happen in my immediate life right now. So that would really depend on if I was a self-sufficient person who had employment and a stable family, or I was a homeless person who had no supports and no infrastructure in my life. Trauma is something that's really mediated by the kind of supports that someone has in their environment, their history of trauma, and what their overall cultural and group experience of trauma or supports are. And I'm sure that this makes sense to all of you when you look at your own lives or people that you know in terms of when difficult things happen and how we cope or heal from those or how we don't cope or don't heal from those. Researchers and educators uh, in Canada and worldwide when we look at the data on other Indigenous groups who have all experienced colonial traumas uh, in the past and in the present agree that when we continue to use non-Indigenous forms of health care and mental health interventions with Indigenous people. This is a continued form of the type of colonial aggression and oppression that we've seen with residential school, with the child welfare system, with the health care system in the past. Today, we see this continue because this delegitimizes Indigenous ways of being and healing or learning and teaching, and continues to perpetuate that original trauma that happened when the Indian Act was first enacted and when different individuals over time had begun to experience these 
very personal and painful assaults uh, at the individual level. Um, when we look at this, this uh, history and this situation in the context of uh, education, we know that in our society today, it's important for all of our young people to graduate from high school. Why do young people need to graduate from high school? So that they can get jobs, so they can go to college, so they can go to university, so they can contribute to society and be part of the solutions and not the problems. Well, when we look at Indigenous youth, we see a high rate of high school non-completion. We see low levels of educational attainment and achievement. And we see these problems as being high for Indigenous populations everywhere, but especially high for Indigenous young people living on reserve. And what that tells us in the literature and the data is that those difficulties in school are closely tied to the history and the current context of oppression within education for Indigenous people. It's important for the education system, for instance, and the employment sector to understand that both education and higher education have been sites of deep and personal harm to Indigenous people, sites of trauma over multi multiple generations. So Indigenous people aren't going to naturally gravitate towards school at any level because of all these traumas that school itself has put on our people over multiple generations, including right now in the school system. Uh, because when we look at the results that came out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report on how residential school harmed the people who went and their families, which is our current generation of young people, what their results show is that there's really four areas that continue to harm Indigenous people in Canada today. And I talked about these a little at the beginning, and that is the child welfare system, the education system, the health care system, and the justice system. And in these four areas, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report, which was done over six years of research, Show, told us that there were 94 ways in these four systems of Canada that changes could be made to stop harming Indigenous people and to allow people thus to begin to heal from those traumas. Because these people cannot heal from the traumas that they experience personally when the system keeps harming them on a daily basis just for being an Indian in Canada, just based on race. Now, a lot of people ask me, you know, what I think about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report and its calls to action. And, you know, it's, it's really important for us as a country to understand that the issues that are raised in this report aren't going to go away, even if reconciliation as a movement goes off people's radar. And this report is an excellent way for us to begin to talk about uh, talk about these issues and come up with solutions. Many people ask me, well, what is it that Indigenous people really want from us? You know, we came here, you got your treaties, you got your, you know, you got your land, you got whatever. Well, first of all, that's not true. None of the treaties have been followed through on the settlers' part, on Canada's part. Secondly, what do Indigenous people want? It's all outlined in this report that was commissioned and published by the TRC. It's put out in 94 concrete terms of what Indigenous people want. And if people want to know what Indigenous people want, in a nutshell, they want self-determination and autonomy on their lives, just like the rest of you have that we don't have because we're a different race that's been subjugated legally and systemically by the country of Canada. It's up to all Canadians to take action on these changes that need to happen. And Indigenous people are taking responsibility for their own healing at the hands of these assaults and aggressions that have happened through the system of policies and laws that have been put onto us. And it's everyone else's responsibility to stop 
perpetrating these oppressions and these harms and to make things right because I don't really think it's realistic for Indigenous peoples as groups to wait around much longer for Canada to follow through on everything that they said they were supposed to follow through in on the beginning. And one day, Canada's going to wake up with the access to all of the things that they started out wanting, the land and the natural resources, is going to be gone. And then people will be wa walking around wondering, what happened? Why are the lights not on? Why is there no more gas? Why is there no more oil? What are we going to do? So I want to close with a, a sort of final question around why it's up to Canadians to take action regarding reconciliation of colonization. And, and we're talking about it in the context of mental health and the mental health disparities um, of Indigenous people. And normally I'd like to have a bit of a discussion around this, but since I have no time left, I will just give what I believe to be the answer to this question, which is because when this country was created by the Indian Act, the Indian Act created two groups of people, one group that benefited from the creation of Canada and one group that was harmed by it. If you were the group that was harmed by it, you were indigenous because the policies were created to exterminate and assimilate a group based on race. If you fall into that group, you were harmed and your current responsibilities are to heal those wounds that were put upon us. I'm responsible for my own healing. I don't walk around blaming the government or blaming systems. I have a broken heart. I have a broken spirit. I have a broken mind. Maybe somebody else broke it, but I have to work on healing myself. That's my job. If you fall into the group that benefited from the creation of the Indian Act and the subjugation and oppression of Indigenous people, you have a responsibility to stop oppressing and subjugating through these systems through these four systems, or through any way that you participate in Canadian society that was created through the Indian Act. Because all of the research that I've done over the last 18 years shows that racism and negative stereotypes are the major barrier to health for Indigenous people in Canada along with access. Access to health, to mental health services, is part of that racism and those negative stereotypes that Indigenous people experience. And that's up to, to all of the non-Native people to deal with. So I guess we don't have time for questions. Yes, we do. Oh, we do? Okay. So. Oh, okay. I was here sweating and panicking because I thought I had two minutes to get off the stage. No, this lady had her hand up first here. Wait till the light goes down, please. Yeah. Yeah. Can I get this thing? <laughs> it's okay? Okay. Thank you for a very enlightening speech. Um, you talk about uh, mostly about social. Uh, things that we as a society can do, but right at the end you did mention what my question is, is the personal prejudice and personal racism, which at least I didn't experience growing up in Montreal, but when I got to Queens and I talked to people from places like Thunder Bay and small towns in Ontario, there was so much prejudice against Native people, um, which I was terribly shocked to hear about. Now, I'm just wondering, uh, how do you, uh, and, and you know, we are very sensitive to anti-Semitism and anti-black and anti-foreign, but it, how, how do we educate people to be, like this racism that I think is still out there. I mean, you hear about the police up in Thunder Bay and so on, uh, you know, this seems to be a big, pro much more of a problem than, we hear talking about. So do you, can you talk about that just a little bit, about how do we deal with that as a society? I don't think it's really acknowledged. The racism. 
Well, I don't, I don't really have an answer for that. I mean, racism, you know, at the psychological level is based on ignorance. So theoretically, if we were to educate Canadians about the history of Canada and the history of Indigenous people and the history of what allowed every Canadian to have what they have today, then maybe that would change. This one? Yes, okay. The concept of mental health comes out of the West in the 20th century. It didn't exist before the 20th century. It still doesn't exist among most of the peoples of the world. Even within the West, many people think that it is drastically overapplied. Why should someone who's a sociopath, for example, be considered mentally ill? To somebody living on Mars, applying the concept of mental health to indigenous populations looks like cultural imperialism. Why isn't it? Well, I, well, I think at, a, a, like, at an epistemological level, it is. And that's part of the oppressive practices of the healthcare system, which is using non-Indigenous forms of healthcare with Indigenous people. But if you were talking about the mental health issues and problems, which is applying directly yourself. Well, I'm a psychologist, and I was asked to come here and talk about mental health. But if you notice in my presentation, I didn't really cite mental health in particular. I talk about overall health um, because... Uh, I think I had a slide here about it. Uh, indigenous health is defined differently than uh, biomedical health. You know, our health is defined holistically and defined within the context of spirituality and relationship. So that's part of uh, the autonomy and the self-determination of, of, of health care and health practices in our communities letting communities determine what that looks like. Hi, uh, John Stewart. I used to live in Minnesota and I was quite close to the, uh, <clears throat> the Sioux in Minnesota and my real name is Red Eagle, <laughs> according to the Sioux people. But the thing I wanted to say really is I think the term truth and it's wrong. It should be truth and consequences, not truth and otherwise. We have to deal with, and each person has to figure out how we manifest our behavior in terms of consequences, not reconciliation. We have to behave in a different way. Maybe we should travel around together and give these talks, because I think a lot of your people would probably listen to you a lot more than they would listen to me. And we both have the name Stuart. So, you know. Well, I'm married into the Stuarts. My ex-husband, he's always like, you're Stuart, and I'm like, no, I'm not. He's like, this is your tartan. I'm like, no, it isn't. <laughs> but I like the name Stuart. It sounds good. I've always... For a while, I've been a bit skeptical about the problems raised by the residential schools. And two weeks ago at church, we were sitting with visitors, and one of them had worked in the uh, office which uh, read these reports. And she found it so terrible that she had to go, and she, it just made her, she couldn't take it. She had to go to another office. And so it's good that you've told us about this. Moving on to the future, look, uh, looking ahead to 25 years into the future, what uh, life would it be good for the indigenous people to have? Where would they live? What jobs would they be doing? Or how would they be uh, making their uh, living and nourishing themselves? What languages would they speak? What uh, faith would they believe in and draw their spirituality from? And uh, can you envisage 25 years from now a much better life for indigenous people, and how do we get there from here? 
Do you want me to answer that? <laughs> well, I can't speak for all Indigenous people. I can really only speak for me and my family, and I can speak on behalf of the work that I do. And I think, again, this might not be the answer you're looking for, but it's, it's really up to Indigenous communities to make those decisions for themselves. Uh, many of our communities have been very uh, deeply and darkly missionized and Christianized. Uh, our traditional people believe that uh, engaging in Christianity is a direct disrespect to our ancestors um, because of the colonial uh, harm that has come to us through Christianity. Uh, and I think having the autonomy to practice our own traditional values and beliefs to have the option to do that when only a few short years ago it was illegal to practice our culture, our spirituality, and our language, um, is, it's, it's an ongoing project to be able to have that belief that we are allowed to be ourselves and to speak our language and to engage in our cultural practices uh, the way immigrants are allowed to do when they come to this country. We still aren't allowed to do that within the systems that govern our lives. So for instance, in education and healthcare, we have a, a legal right to indigenous healing and language, for instance, in healthcare. Where, where is that available? It's not. So having access to indigenous healing and indigenous education within the systems that are thrust upon us is one way that we could see concrete changes and improvements. Okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, could you speak about the Indian Act? Uh, there have been calls for getting rid of the Indian Act. Indigenous people seem to, some want to get rid of it, some seem to want to keep it. What, what is the source of controversy? I, I'm, I'm, I'd like to understand it a bit more. The Indian Act s subjugates Indigenous people to be wards of the crown. And I'm not sure what the controversy is that you're talking about, but maybe I'm not aware of those things. Well, I can't really make a commentary about Indian politics. Um, the Indian Act is part of a large system that uh, supports, the Indian Act created the, band, the chief and band and council system and created the reserves and funds those. If those just got taken away tomorrow, Native people would be out on the street with nothing. So I, maybe, maybe that's what you're talking about. There has to be something else. And, and I don't really know what that is, but it has to be something that addresses the human rights violations that continue to exist for Indigenous people. I would like to ask you, uh, I would like to ask you uh, how you would get the young uh, Indian people to graduate from high school. What would make them like education after the horrible experiences of the residential school so that they would stay in school, graduate from high school, go to college like you did, to university and so forth and so on? What would you suggest? Uh, indigenous education should be by Indigenous people for Indigenous people. And that's not really the case, except by exception. Um, I was just wanting to end on a very positive note, that when I began teaching up here, I was an immigrant, and I taught uh, one of my classes was the Mohawk chief's son. And he took it upon himself to educate me about the, the Indian Act and about the residential schools and so on. But he was in college. He was taking a degree. He was looking forward to being able to move between the two cultures, which I would have thought would have been very important, that, that you could do both things. He was talking about the healing process. They were having tents that were healing places, but he was also against some of the projects like the St. James Water Project, 
He thought that that was going on into Indian land and they were getting politically motivated too. And then uh, as part of our thing, we, they went to Niagara Falls and he was furious when he came back because being held up as Mohawk beading and so on that for sale, and he said it was obviously made in China, no Mohawk was, you know, would, would deign to say that this belonged to us. So there's, there's sort of a, 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 an awakening among that generation at least that they have got to do something, as you were saying, for yourself, but also they have to participate in the political stream as well. And he was definitely going to do that. So, you know, uh, to me, that was very positive. Okay? Do you have comments to that? Or is this our last question? No, no, I don't have a comment. Thank you. Um, it was a very powerful talk. Thank you for that. Uh, I am trying in my mind, uh, I'll be brief, to connect it in some ways with the first two talks that we heard this morning. And it strikes me that uh, first, by necessity, uh, the first look we had uh, at society was through the lens of economics. Uh, the second talk, of course, from well, the sociological point of view, uh, I am wondering if you would have any comment on uh, some of the economic aspects, and I'm aware that you are a psychologist, but uh, <clears throat> I imagine that uh, some of the economic inequalities also ultimately flow, flow from residential schools and so forth. The second is, uh, what do we leave our, for, to our next generation? We heard uh, what we leave to the second generation in financial terms. Could you comment on what uh, elders and others can leave to the next generation of um, indigenous people? Well, thank you for raising those important points. So because of the policies of the Indian Act, which whose objective were to um, to eradicate the population of indigenous people, it has left the population dead, dying, and sick because those were the objectives of all of the policies. The policies of the Indian Act continue to that objective to eradicate the population. So we have a population who's a drain on the economy. Until we get rid of the policies of the Indian Act that continue to harm and subjugate indigenous people and allow them to have autonomy and self-determination around all of the system aspects of their lives, so education, health, economics, infrastructure, um, policing, uh, justice, child welfare, the population will not begin to be productive members of society as a whole because everything that's given or done to them systemically by the policies do not allow them to be well. So it's up to Canada, who made these rules and enforces these rules, to change these rules and make these rules different so they actually support the healing, health, and well-being of this population. It's not up to us. We can't change your Canadian policies. We're not even really Canadians. You guys are Canadians. We're Indigenous people. We are not Canadians under your system. We're wards of the crown. We are not having the same rights and freedoms that you have. The Indian Act has created a two-tiered system for health and education, for instance, for our people. Child welfare laws have been extremely disastrous to our population. Uh, so it's up to you guys to go to your politicians and say, you know what, you need to help work on changing these laws to make things better for Native people. And our job is to try to ask you people to do that. Because we have no power, we have no rights, we have no ability in your system provincially or federally. Everything to do with natives is administered at the federal level, not by the city, not by the province. Does that answer your question, sort of? Thank you. Wow.
Is this mic on now? Thank you so much, Suzanne, for that very powerful talk. As a token of our thanks, we have Peter Russell's book called Canada's Odyssey, which is about the three pillars of our history, the French, the English, and the indigenous. And I must say, I learned a lot from it about those three pillars. He's autographed it to you with a special acknowledgement of the education he got from the Diné Nation that made it possible to write this book. Thank you.